I'm Yang Mu Kim, and this is Applied Digital Signal Processing. In our last video, we introduced the Fourier series, which reveals the precise amount of individual frequencies present in periodic signals. But remember that in the Fourier series, the component frequencies are all harmonics or multiples of the fundamental frequency, which is the inverse of the period of the signal. This works great for periodic signals, but many, if not most signals, aren't precisely periodic or even close to periodic. So perhaps you're thinking, what about those signals? This is really crucial because as I emphasized in the last video, frequencies are the building blocks of signals. Can we find the frequency composition of non-periodic signals? The short answer, fortunately, is yes. The longer, more detailed answer is that it takes some special hacks, grounded in solid theory, but I think you'll agree they really are hacks. Remember, computing the Fourier series requires only one period of a signal because it assumes that it just repeats forever. So what if we take a segment of a signal and just pretend that it's periodic? Is that a legit thing to do? Well, let's try it and see what happens. Here we take one segment that's 20 milliseconds or 0 0.02 seconds in length. This segment sort of looks periodic in there, but that's okay. We haven't made any assumptions about it being periodic. And here's what this segment sounds like. Yep, that was it. I know it's hard to believe there'll be anything useful in there, but let's just repeat it and see how it goes. In the previous video, I used continuous time and integration, but it's the same principle and nearly the same equation for sampled discrete time signals. Remember, the complex exponential is just a sinusoid with cosine and sine components. So we still multiply our segment by the cosine and sine of the fundamental frequency. In this case, the length of our segment is 20 milliseconds, so the inverse of that is 50 hertz. Next, we sum over the multiplied segments to determine the weight or contribution of that frequency. Then we repeat that process at multiples of the fundamental frequency, in this case 100, 150, and 200 hertz. So far so good. Let's take this further. Let's take it to 16 frequencies. Now this is getting interesting. You can see that there's stronger contributions from 300 and particularly at 350 hertz, and then again at 650 and 700 hertz. If we keep going to more and more frequencies, it starts to get really interesting. This plot shows the magnitude of the Fourier series weights up to 5,000 hertz. So this is a magnitude spectrum. But from this graph, you might think that the big peaks are the only ones that matter since some of the other frequencies are so small. For many audio and other signals, we often look at the spectrum on a different scale, in decibels, which compresses those magnitudes to better reflect what we can actually hear. This view is a decibel spectrum, or dB spectrum. You've probably also noticed a pattern emerging of regular peaks indicating greater amounts of that frequency present. You might even say it's harmonic. Now, please note, this is a different harmonic series than our Fourier series. This pattern is emerging because harmonics are the natural outcome of physical processes like the vibration of a guitar string or the airflow from a person's voice, as I described in the last video. But notice that the frequencies and harmonics present in the signal don't always line up with our Fourier series, like between 300 and 350 hertz. Maybe the true frequency in the segment is something in between, like 335 hertz. Can we determine that precise frequency and that of others that aren't exactly lined up with our Fourier series? So this is almost what we want. And as the song goes, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you need. What I've described so far is what's called the Fourier transform, where we take a bit of signal, repeat it periodically, and compute the Fourier series. It's a bit of a hack, yes, but it gets the job done. And though it may not perfectly reveal the frequencies we want, we'll see it provides everything we need. Let's go back to our signal. Remember, what we're really getting from the Fourier transform is the periodic replication of that 20 millisecond segment. 
Here's what that sounds like if we repeat it for a full second. Still can't tell what it is, but you might hear something like a note, so maybe it's from a bit of music. Here's the Fourier transform of the original periodically extended segment. The most common mistake people make with the Fourier transform is to treat these output frequencies as the only ones that exist. Remember, those frequencies arise from the assumption of periodicity, which was our hack for taking just a bit of signal and repeating it. There are potentially other frequencies present in the signal segment, but we don't yet have a way of seeing them. A second common related mistake is to think about the input to the Fourier transform not as a repeated segment, but as just the segment in isolation, kind of like this. Let's dig a little deeper into that. What if we do explicitly isolate that segment by adding some zeros to it before we take its Fourier transform? We call this zero padding. It will still be periodic, but now with spaces of zeros or silence between the repeated segments, which sounds like this. As we put it into isolation by adding silence to it, we create a longer segment and thus a longer period. Now, a longer period means the Fourier components are now more closely spaced, providing higher frequency resolution. If we further extend the period with zeros, we can obtain those frequencies in the gaps between our original frequencies. So we can get a better idea of the precise frequencies present within a segment. Note how the original Fourier series frequencies are perfectly on this line, but how the frequencies in between might not do what you expect. If we take a look at it as a whole, without the original points, it looks kind of bumpy. Are all those little bumps frequencies that are present in the original signal? Actually, no. They are an artifact of our isolating the segment with silence. By just cutting off our segment and going to zero, we've introduced an artificial sharp transition that results in those extra frequencies around the actual frequency components, which we call side lobes. Is there anything we can do about that? Yes, but it requires a bit more hacking. And again, you can't always get what you want, exactly. What if we taper the edges of our segment to smooth out any sudden transitions, multiplying our signal by another sinusoid function so we get very gently back to zero, like this. Now, don't be fooled. It may look like a Fourier sinusoid, but it's not. It's what we call a window function. This particular one is called a Hanning or Han window function but it's just a sinusoid. Multiplying by this window results in a gently tapered transition to zero. After we apply the window, here is the resulting Fourier transform. So there's a lot less of the extra side lobes, but it comes at a cost. Can you see it? The bumps around the actual frequencies or main lobes are now wider than before. But that's a trade-off we can probably accept, since we can still easily pick out the frequencies present in the original segment. So now we're almost where we want to be. But there's one last thing that's pretty important. We've been looking at a very short signal segment, but most sounds are much longer, seconds, or in the case of entire songs, minutes. Here's a snippet of music that's just over 13 seconds. Now, there's no theoretical limit to the Fourier transform though there is a computational limit in dealing with long signals, but that's not the real problem. The real problem is that the Fourier transform doesn't tell us when a frequency occurs within a signal. As far as the Fourier transform knows, they could be anywhere or everywhere in whatever segment we're analyzing. So for a really long signal segment, thus really long periods, like the 13 seconds of this clip, the Fourier transform will provide very precise frequencies, but we've lost our sense of time any of the individual frequencies you see in this plot could occur anywhere in the 13 seconds of this signal. So the longer our segment, the less time resolution we have, but the shorter our segment, the less frequency resolution we have. While we'd like to have perfect time and frequency information, once again, we can't always get what we want. Is there an acceptable trade-off or compromise we can make? Fortunately, there is, and it's called the Short Time Fourier Transform, and we already know how to do it. Let's zoom into a short segment of our signal, about a tenth of a second. Even zoomed in, let's apply very short windows, in this case 20 milliseconds, the same segment length we started with earlier in this video. We multiply our short segment 
by the window function to smooth out the edge effects and take the Fourier transform. Now we simply slide our window over by half of its duration. This is called the hop length. Since the window is 20 milliseconds long, we hop by 10 milliseconds. This is because of the tapering of our window. If we jump too far, we'll lose the part of our signal in between our windows. Hopping at half the window length or less is pretty standard. Again, we multiply our segment by the window and then take the Fourier transform. Now we can repeat this process again and again, all the way through our signal. You might imagine the resulting sequence of Fourier transforms as a kind of movie, which is exactly what it is. Each magnitude spectrum is a frame that corresponds to a moment in time of a signal. Let's see what that movie looks like for our entire 13 second music signal. Now, I think these spectrum movies are fun to watch and they are the basis of most cool music visualizers. But it can be difficult to isolate a particular frequency or moment. So there's another common view that we use to visualize the short time Fourier transform. We place frequency on the vertical axis, time on the horizontal axis, and then use color to indicate the intensity of a particular frequency for that window in time. This is called the spectrogram and it's a great way of seeing changes in frequencies within a signal over time. This particular musical excerpt starts with a solo voice at the beginning, which you can see here as harmonic frequencies that move together, but not in precisely straight lines. This is typical of the voice or violin, where the fundamental frequency can vary continuously. Other instruments enter about halfway through, which you can see with the straight lines of harmonic frequencies typical of keyboard or breath powered instruments. Now let's listen to the music in sync with the spectrum movie and the spectrogram. You can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, well you might find. This is typically how we identify frequency-based features in audio, by listening for sound events, sometimes over and over, and looking for corresponding changes in the spectrogram. Feel free to go back and replay this segment of the video a few times so you can relate what's happening in the music with the spectrogram. Because it lets us view changes in the frequency content of a signal over time, the spectrogram, or short time Fourier transform, is one of the most important tools in DSP. For audio signals, we generally use the following parameters. Short windows in the tens of milliseconds in length. We isolate or zero pad each windowed segment, which provides higher frequency resolution for each transformed frame. And we use a hop length, the amount of time between our Fourier transforms, of a half window or less. Put together, while we can't get perfect time and frequency knowledge of a signal, the STFT definitely gives us what we need to do some really powerful signal processing. Thanks for watching.